Welcome to the TAF Hub. This is a brand new show brought to you by TAF Africa Global to educate you on real estate business and all the information you need to know about real estate. After 45 years of construction and real estate development in eight African countries, it is time to share my experience and it can only be done in the TAF Hub. We will be inviting experts who will give you facts and the right regulations on real estate development. Join us every week on our social media platforms for an exciting show. You can also watch us on JRTS TV every Sunday at 8.30 p.m. Uh, we are going to have our keynote speaker. Uh, the next man that I'm about to call on stage, he really needs no introduction. He is the only approved and recognized youth man over the age of 65. <laughs> This phenomenal figure has a career that spans more than 45 years in real estate development, housing, construction, philanthropy, and public speaking. He continues to give back to his community through the renowned Tough Hub and the series that we all love and sharing valuable insights on business, finances, and wealth creation. He also launched his own academy, helping the next generation of business leaders. This has won him numerous awards across the sub-region, recognizing the impactful work that he does and continues to do for Gambia and Africa as a whole. He was awarded the Entrepreneur of the Year, West Africa issued by CNBC, All Africa Business Leaders Awards in November of 2017. He also was the Honorable Businessman of the Year issued by the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, in January of 2011, and the Businessman of the Year um, by GCCI, which is the Gambia Chamber of Commerce and Industries, in May of 2006. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the singular honor and privilege to call on no other but the incomparable Mr. Mustafa Njai Taf. Thank you so much. Um, these days, uh, when I do this, I carry my phone and um, make sure I stay on the time that's allocated. So just allow me to put my stopwatch on because I can go non-stop. I um, have been allocated 30 minutes, so there we go, let's start. So, um, members of the high table, my sister, um, Madam Ami Bensuda, uh, the representative from ITC, the representative from um, uh, Minister of Trade, and uh, my um, dear nephew, or my son, actually. You know, what I, what I do these days when I do th these things, I don't write speeches because I speak my heart. Because whatever we're going through here, I've gone through it, through it already. Let me first start that when I sat with my sister, Madam Bensuda, there, I turned to her that do you realize that we are the eldest here? And that's, that's very common now. Um, wherever we go in events like this, that's the reality. And then she said, so yes, we were classmates. So without guessing her age, you know her age. And then um, uh, George came on the podium and called me an uncle. Yes, actually, um, George's father started me in business, Sharbel el Haj. So what goes around comes around. And we ended up, we ended up, you know, jointly owning some major businesses. I don't know how old you guys are to remember Taf Bell, but Madam Bensuda will remember it, and I'm sure Madam Jarlo will remember it. Um, we used to own a 100-room hotel. I think today it's called Saj. We sold it afterwards, and it was owned by us. So there's always been the need for angel investors. So he was an investor in my business. I owned the land. I was going to build a hotel, and we ended up calling the hotel Taf Bell, meaning Taf and Sir Bell. So whatever you're doing is not new. Now let's go to the core of the business. Um, I was asked to speak on the theme which is um, positioning the Gambia 
as a regional service center. And they want me to speak, you know, in relation to promoting investment promotion, you know, in the country. Now, what is very common also is that I hate speaking to myself or to the wrong people. And that's what happens most of the time these days, especially in this country. When we talk about investment promotion, I want to turn and see those who are responsible for investment promotion. But you turn and all I see here are you know, upcoming entrepreneurs. But all the same, um, I would like to make my presentation you know, giving you examples or assuming we all know that when you want to go and play in the Premier League, because the league that every footballer wants to get into. If you want to get in there, what do you do? You go for your medicals. So you must be fit. Apart from the skills, you must be fit to play there. And if you fail your medicals, you cannot play. So if we're trying to get Gambia positioned as, the regional, as a regional service center, what do we do? I would like to take you through a SWOT analysis of this country. I guess we do know what a SWOT analysis is. Young ones, do you know what SWOT analysis is? Uh, you know? Okay, good. Which is one, looking at our strength, our weaknesses, the opportunities we have, and the threats. And in this conversation, we need to be very frank and honest with ourselves. Because we are operating within a sub-region of about 15 countries or so, isn't it? Coastline, there's a number of us along the coast. So if we want to position ourselves as the regional center, we need to do this SWOT analysis, first addressing our strength. So I'll start with our strength. One, geographical positioning. As I mentioned, yes, that's a strength. We are geographically located you know, in a very good position because if we were to fly from here to America, it's about six, seven hours. South America, probably shorter. Going into the sub-region, same. Going to um, uh, Europe, six hours or so. The Middle East is short. So that's our strength. But when you have a strength, you need to capitalize on it. Then also, it's relatively a peace and a and a stable country. Although we have some few issues nowadays, but I mean, to be very relative, I can still walk down the Senegambia Strip or go into Kololi, one o'clock in the morning, and then somebody will shout, oh, Uncle Taf, only in the Gambia. Or you find George walking there. George dare not walk in Port Harcourt by himself. Or I dare not even drive a car in Port Harcourt. So it's relatively peaceful. Then a youthful population. I think we have over 60% of our population are youth. But again, across the board in Africa, it's more or less the same. Now, our social diversity and cohesion. I think that's a strength. At times when I have guests with me, they are surprised at the way we, we interrelate. I went to a burial on Sunday, and I was shocked to see some people who were related you know, to the same family that I was related to. I was shocked to know this, and that was a reality. They were related by marriage. But that's who we are. We have a saying, that if you lift your hand here in the Gambia, trying to strike a blow, before you do, somebody will say, no, don't. You're, blowing, you're putting the blow on your own self. So these days, at our age, I identify people by their parents or where they're born from, whatever. And then there's always a relationship one way or the other. Now, agriculture. Agriculture for this country is a strength. Fertile oil. Fertile soil, soil, good amount of rainfall, even the water, uh, underground water, quite a number of underground water. Um, half of the length of this country is with um, uh, clear, clean, well, not clean, but good water for agriculture. So this is a, this is a good strength. 
a beautiful tropical weather for tourists. Tourists come in here and they love it. So that's also another strength that we have. And then on top land in the rural area. Not only the rural area, I mean, I drive to Tough City. I'm sure you do know about Tough City, so I will not do any promotion about it. But every time I drive from my house in Brufut to, to, to Gujur, all I see is green. And that's what keeps knocking in my head. This is a country where if you eat watermelon and throw the seeds, come back in the next one year, you will find melon growing. So this is an absolute strength. It's a good strength that we have. Now, let's go on to the weaknesses, which is a difficult one. And if you have an ailment, you need to address it. And that is why it's good to talk to the ears that will listen. That look, this is a weakness, and when you have a weakness, you address it. If you are limping, what do you do? You see them, they pad you up. You need to adjust. And I think as a country, we need to address our weaknesses. And I will now list out the weaknesses. One of them is poor infrastructure. And when I say infrastructure, it's not only road, but ICT. Because here we want to be a regional service center. And number one in being a regional service center is, is um, um, ICT. Actually, I told somebody that if you were to ask me that tell me one thing that they should fix in this country. You know what I will tell them? It's not power, it's not water. For me, the internet. That's my preference. Because with the internet, I have the world, and I don't have an option. I have an option of getting a generator. I have an option of putting up solar, wind. I can do that on my own. Water, I can drill a borehole. But internet, I have no choice but to go through the IT providers. Now, out of convenience, drive an hour more, with maybe 200 kilometers more, go through the bridge, then go through the ferry. The rest you know is history. I will not go into details. But I drove from Dakar to Ker Aib. There was zero police checkpoint. Over 200 and something kilometers. And when you enter Farifanye, I need not tell you what will happen. If we are serious, we want to attract investors, we need to address this. It's a serious weakness. Then currency, obviously, you know, so rather than probably investing in, a, in the Gambia or any other English-speaking country, if I invest in a French-speaking country, the currency is stable. The CFA um, euro has always been 665. So this is also a weakness. The economy, a GDP of one point, what, 1.2 billion? Serious weakness. I'm not sure, I'm not sure we have more than 1.2 billion GDP. Huh? Aliko Dangote is worth 14 billion. So if you want to measure wealth, this is the, the other things that you should look at. So yes, we are a country, but we are too small. So to attract certain investment, it is almost impossible to do it. Unless you are very smart, unless you put in certain values in the way you promote your country to allow people to come in. Like for example, Rwanda, like Dubai, uh, in the UAE, like uh, Singapore. You need to work harder and you know, do extraordinary things to be able to attract investments. Limited access to trade markets. Lack of strategy, obviously, FDI, I, men I mentioned that. Um, skills shortage. Skills is an issue in this country across the board. And it affects everybody. If you think that it doesn't affect you, go and buy your latest Range Rover. And then have a problem with it. Who will fix it? A Range Rover probably that should serve you for about 15, 20 years will serve you two years in this country. And across the board, it's skills. Now we import skills. That's the reality. Skills, unskilled labor is important into this country. We need, it's an SOS. We're trying to develop 5,000 houses. So there's a market. There's employment that is available. But laborers needs are being imported into this country now. 
So there's serious skill shortage. I'm not talking about skills, carpenters and masons and so on, but ordinary laborers, they get imported into this country. So it's one of your weaknesses. What happened? Rather than paying a laborer here $200 or so, you bring him in from Nigeria or from Sierra Leone, he gets paid 500 So how can Uncle Taf make his houses cheap? There's no affordable labor. Same with materials and so on. Water, electricity shortage. We all know the history. Since 1979, we have had this issue. We are a country of 2.5 million people. That shouldn't be an issue. So it's a serious weakness, and apart from that, it's expensive. Power is expensive in this country. So if you want to attract investment where people want to come in and in, in, invest heavily, they will have a problem. Now let me go to the opportunities. The difficult part where the weaknesses. And the weaknesses, I mean, people take it personal. So please, tell your guys, we are in this game together. We're in this game together as, as Gambians, so when we are in rooms like this, in forests like this, we need to be honest and frank with each other that, look, this is a problem. And it affects me, you, and the other. Actually, my biggest investor that I tell people all the time, my business, biggest partner in my business is government. Because I don't have any other partner. But I pay them tax. So if I make more money, they collect more. So government should encourage me and make sure that I make more money. So they're a partner. Then, now, on the opportunities, I think I'm about 18 minutes gone, so I still have time. AFCFTA. A -A 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 -F -C -F -T -A. I've never seen, you know, an acronym this long and difficult to pronounce. You know, um, the Africa, what, continental free trade area. Great opportunity, great, great um, initiative. So we need to exploit it. I mean, I think it's meant for countries like us. So it's an opportunity that if I were to produce anything here, and by the time I conclude, I will thank you, I tell you what I think we should be looking at, we will easily have a market of what? 1.4 billion people. It has already been signed and it's in, it's in, it's in place. Now, investing in employment and skills training, TIVET, it's an opportunity. You know, for me, if I had my way and I was sitting there, the reason why I will, I will invest in you guys and give you skills, you will now be exported. That would be my goal. That is what my, my objective would be. Imagine all these young people who are going, you know, through the back way. If they had skills, what would happen? They will walk straight into jobs. If they were good carpenters, good masons, good tilers, whatever. If they learn in Europe, I mean, there's a shortage of skills. But they will be employed. But they go there unskilled. When um, uh, Qatar was building the stadiums, they imported skills. So imagine if we had very good and well-trained young um, uh, uh, tradesmen. We'll, imp we'll export them. And what happens when you export them? They send back hard currency. So this, the, you are our natural resources. So it's an opportunity. Now, um, again, um, investing in aqua and agriculture. Aqua, that's my newest area. I want to drop now um, uh, real estate development. And it just makes sense. It makes sense to invest in agriculture and aquaculture. Everybody complains about fish. How much does fish cost now? Very costly. But nobody goes fishing in the ocean anymore. That's outdated. You farm fish. We have 40 kilometers of coastline. It can be done on an industrial basis. And the, the returns are super high. One, you feed your population. Two, you export it. Agriculture, memsos, it's the same. Today, nobody talks about peanuts and so on. You talk about the green gold. You know the green gold? Avocado. In two years, two and a half years, you can plant avocado and start exporting it. And the good thing about avocado is that there's a variety that can be in the water, on the waters for two months. So you can ship it over land. So, you know, agriculture has always been the backbone of our economy, but being neglected. Government needs to look into agriculture. 
and encourage you know, the private sector maybe and other, others to invest in it. Again, facilitate the optimum participation and contribution of the diaspora. I'm happy to learn that gain with gain you get attracting the diaspora. This is no rocket science. Rocket science. Twenty-two percent of our GDP is being contributed by the diaspora. We need not ask for loans and grants. We need to harness this opportunity. So that's another one. And then we need to invest in technology. Technology, solar. We have what twelve hours of sunlight. If you go to Tough City now, we're not connected to, to Nawek for the moment. It's everything that you see there is run by, you know, solar, it's solar driven. Now let me quickly go to the threats. The threats are a poor governance system. That's a threat, we need to work on it. Governance is an issue. Again, um, our present educational system. I've been advocating for this for a while, but I'm happy that the Minister of Higher Education now agrees that they're going to have one Tibet center every region. We need to change the curriculum. I am very passionate about this, so I look at the figures, statistics. In our schooling system, there are 400,000 kids. So you can work it out. Divide 400 by 12, 400,000 by 12, to tell you how many of them, you know, graduate from high school. Only 18% actually gets into high school. 18% of them. The rest, they drop out at grade nine, or even before. They are unskilled. You know, this is a huge threat to us. Obviously, if you have a youthful population who are unemployed, who are uneducated, what do you do? Crime goes up. So this is something that we need to address. Climate change and global warming and lack of work ethics. Climate change, we are told that Banjul, we are going to lose it in the next few years. It's a reality. So climate change is a reality. We saw the rains about, what, a month ago or two? And uh, everybody thought, you know, started the blame game. No, it's for real. Climate change is real. Worse was Pakistan. One third of the land in, in Pakistan was underwater. So it wasn't that there was a flood. It wasn't a flood. Because you couldn't pump the water out. And Banjul is threatened. I mean, it's documented. People know this. That probably even in the next decade or two, we might lose Banjul completely. So we need to address this. What they do, I'm not here to tell you what they should do, but it is a threat. And when you have a threat, you need to address it. High unemployment rate, I told you about crime. Um, uh, skill shortage, I told you about incre increased land, uh, land, land, access to land. Huge threat. The Gambia ranks ninth in the list of dense populated countries in Africa. Huge threat. Wherever you have civil wars or crime or anything happening, it's because of land. It started. Today, try to buy land. Go to the courts. So we need to step in and regulate this and do it properly. There's, there's the need for master plan. The reason why you have 10, 20, 30 people fighting for land is not by accident. The reason is because population density is high in this country. So we need people to start thinking, how do we now deep on density, how do you have the right word for it? To lower down the density or at least spread. Spread the people out. Good planning. Why should everybody come to Banjul and, you know, in the peri urban area? Why can't we start investing in the upper river, um, the middle, uh, or Makati Island, lower river? So we keep some of those who migrate into here. And again, there can be development. So there's a need for that. Population density is a big threat for this country, and we need to address it. Now, to sum up, I think I have five minutes. Solutions that we need to do, and some of the problems that I see in this country, is the issue of not seeing the country as one. We must, and I think this should go back to our curriculum, where young ones are taught about patriotism, the love for country, that it's not longer about tough alone. It's not about you, Mrs. Bensuda, but it's about a country. And remembering that, 
if the country survives, all of us are winners. If we don't, all of us are losers. That's the reality. Now, what I normally tell people is that it's like, assume you are in a boat or in a canoe. And in the canoe, Mr. Drame has got some gold. Mrs. Jalo has got some silver. Madam Bersura, give, take the diamond. I only have coal. Now, we might all have our wealth, but if that canoe sinks, we all go down together. So I think there's the need for a call for a sense of nationalism, that look, we see country first. Regardless of our religion, our gender, our tribe, and most common today, our political affiliation. If we don't see together as one country, one Gambia, and address our problems, there's no way we can, comp we can compete in the sub-region. For example, tourism. We had an edge over the whole West African sub-region. At my age now, you know me, I'm a youth pa, and, and by the way, I'm here, you're going to be the youth lady now, because you're here, so I'm the youth man, you'll be the youth lady. But there's passion in dealing with the people that you. So I play double role. Um, next week, I've been trying to go into Senegal. I have three friends that we just, at times we break off for a week and drive around. So there's this new hotel. Who knows the um, uh, Rue de Baobab? Baobab? How many rooms? 500 rooms. They're trying to build 1,000. We cannot find a room over the weekend. All these other hotels in the Gambia are empty. We still think that we are the tourism king. We have been overtaken. Read the Baobab, five star. I cannot find a room there. So we need to watch our neighbor. If you call them by name, we see it. But every time I go there, I ask myself, do we really go and see what these guys are doing? I was there two weeks ago, had a meeting um, uh, in the main center of Dakar. The person said, oh no, I was going to ask him for his car. He said, no, 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 I don't use my car now. I walk in Jamnyajo, I'm going to catch the train. 25 minutes, Dakar Center, good train as good as anywhere in the world. Infrastructure is ongoing. They have their issues, but things are being addressed. It is a reality that now the fastest way to get your goods into Banjul is through Dakar port. We see it all the time. The port in Funyun, Dubai port wall, is building another port. Now, going to Dakar, you cross through that bridge in Funyun. So, we need to wake up. We need to see ourselves as Gambians, that we owe this to ourselves to work together to push this country. It is small, it's manageable, there are opportunities. And we must stop this issue of personalizing things. You talk to a government official, the first thing he addresses you, well, why are you saying it? Who is he? Where is he coming from? We've had our experiences. That has to stop, otherwise we are all losers. I am speaking as an investor. I invest in the most so-called difficult places like Nigeria. But there I am seen as an investor. And I am highly regarded as a successful real estate developer. For the past two, uh, last, yesterday I was on a webinar as a speaker on the housing solutions in Nigeria as they celebrate their 62nd, 62nd university. In here, I hardly can talk to a public officer on the issue of housing. So we need to look ourselves as Gambians, white, yellow, blue, um, uh, the colors are mostly with parties, yellow, white, green, whatever. Listen, gentlemen, thank you very much. South Africa Global is the first and biggest private estate developer in the Gambia and presents in seven other African countries. We take pride in leading innovation in all spheres of real estate sector in the Gambia and beyond. As such, we are launching the development of the first smart and modern office and retail towers in the Gambia called Taft Twins. The Taft Twins is located in the heart of the Carnifique Institutional Area and 10 minutes drive away from Banjo. Taft Twins is designed to have five floors of office spaces, 
ranging from 50 square meters to over 1,000 square meters. With two elevators, central air conditioning, 24 hours electricity, and water supply, with the ground floor reserved for banking, supermarket, restaurant, and coffee shop. For your bookings and reservations, please call now on 376-2333 or 776-2333. Thank you.